That's really a great score, Wojciech. I just really enjoyed listening to that. There's a lot to talk about, but that is just some fun scoring in there and a great way for me to end my work day here. Uh, having evaluated all those scores from the dotted semi-brev level, except for a couple that I evaluated a day or two before. So just really, really fun. Such uh, a great way to orchestrate optimism, I have to say. Um, so let's look at the practicalities of this. I'm not really seeing a lot of um, a lot of problems here in terms of uh, notation or articulation or, or anything like that. But I, I would once again I've, I have um, I have let other people know that this is the correct way to score mezzo staccato, right? You wouldn't want to score a slur over mezzo staccato and then continuing on to another note, right? It just because it's sort of like you're mezzo staccatoing and you're mezzo staccatoing off of off of the last note into a regularly slurred note. It doesn't really make any sense. Like with the with the way that breath works for a um, for a wind player or or for a string player either, right? And then there's a couple like strange things like here you've got these uh, measured tremolos, like 16th notes. And as with other scores, I'm really not sure if you intended this to be um, like unmeasured tremolo, like the uh, like this uh, cymbal roll, or whether you intended this to be da 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 You know what I mean? So I think that, just like I mentioned before, write out, like if you really intend this, then write four 16th notes in a row, and then do the abbreviation after that. And that'll be really, really clear to the player. Because oftentimes, composers get this wrong. They will mark um, they will mark a double beam when they mean a triple beam, okay? And especially in the context of the way that you've got this scored, it really looks like it's intended to be unmeasured tremolo, right? Because it's, it's, you're, you're scoring this in an atmospheric way, right? But whether you intended this to be unmeasured tremolo or measured tremolo 16th notes, you wouldn't want to be putting a slur mark over it, right? Because it doesn't mean anything. Like the, the, there is no slur going on here. The, the bow is just trembling back and forth really rapidly under the, under the player's wrist. So this, you know, th there isn't any way to cover anything with one bow because there are like a couple hundred bow strokes going on between here and there, right? if it's unmeasured tremolo. So yeah, and then all of this, I mean, the the general slurring of other parts, it's really pianistic look, like, you know, just sort of dropping it from the piano onto the score, right? And, and it's, um, you know, you just have to decide, you know, do you want any emphasis at all on the downbeat of these bars, right? And if you do, then break the slur. Right, so that you stop here, and then you, then the player tongues on the downbeat here. Right, the same thing here. You know, you want to go. Okay, so if that's, if you just wanted a little bit of a flurry here, like bird singing or whatever, or just sort of a rising, you know, kind of rising um, spirit of the of the composer, then I guess that's okay. Right, but yeah, so just I mean, just watch out with some of these things. The same thing here, like this. You know, mezzo staccato on all of these parts, right? So just watch out for all of those things, please, right? And and just once again, you know, da. You really want that all one bow, or do you want da da, or do you want da da da? There's a bunch of different ways to bow this, right? Um, and just just putting a slur over it doesn't solve any problems if you're you know if you just unless you really really intend that but it doesn't feel like you do because of just the way that this this the end of this slur you know the ends of these slurs are not really doing anything right so okay all right so now let's talk about scoring so we've got these surging this kind of surging background strings um you know just a little bit of pizzicato below uh and then we've got our the treatment of our melody Okay, here we're not, I'm not seeing which flute player, which player is intended to play what when. Is this supposed to be played by the first player? 
The second player, same thing here, clarinet in A, which which clarinet in A, right? Obviously there are two, right? There should be, this should be two clarinets in A or clarinet in A, one comma two. And I'm guessing the same thing with, uh, um, with yeah, bassoons one and two, right? Okay, so well, I need to know who is, you know, who is playing what line at any given time, if it's a due or a two, if it is, um, if it's just like one and so on. So, cause like, what we've got here is we've got octaves, we've got clarinet octaves, which are, are very, um, you know, bass clarinet and clarinet. Um, they are very pungent, right? Even just like, I mean, the clarinet and the bass clarinet is less pungent than two clarinets playing octaves. However, okay, the problem is right here, like adding flute to that on top, you end up with a very, band-like tone and the sounds the sound set here is not lying to us this time the um the note performer sounds they are um they you know they, they are telling you pretty close to what you would hear there even with good players there'll be kind of a band-like sound and then here where we really are stacking a lot of the same um, you know, a lot, lot like the same line we're doubling, tripling across all of the wind instruments. Okay, is that really a great sound? You know, is that the right kind of sound that we want there? And also, especially considering that the flute, like the more you add onto this, the less flute you're going to hear until you get to about, around right here, right? So right here, the flute will, you just hear a touch of flute against the clarinet unless the flute was marked, say, forte or something, or, you know, if there was some sort of balancing here. Then here, just like a really, really thick tone, um, very wind ba band-like, very Russian kind of sounding. And then here we're kind of climbing up as we go with like, um, it's getting kind of high there for the English horn, but I mean, still, it's still playable, but it's still not like just kind of the greatest, um, you know, the greatest mixture with the other players since you've already got You've got your beautiful eloquent oboe already playing those notes, right? So, you know, up to up to right around here. And and you've also got the flute playing at the same time, but you're stacking English horn on top of that. What if the English horn was playing at an octave below, right? Wouldn't that possibly be better just because the the um the kind of thicker quality of the English horn is going to really dominate this and and it will you know, adding that to the oboe, it'll be hard for it to, for the intonation of the oboe player and the English horn player to really match as it starts to get very high for the English horn player. Plus, that in itself is going to stomp over this flute right in here. So it's just really not that well balanced, right? Uh, I mean, it's nice and thick and fascinating, but it isn't necessarily the most balanced kind of um, scoring. Okay, but this is kind of cool, the way you come out of it with English horn below and then flutes above and everything else, right? And you've got your little ding from the glockenspiel and celesta and everything else. So that's all really cool right in here. I like the I like the way that you support all of that with the lower winds and the horns and just kind of continuing on with the strings. So that is really, really cool. Not so sure how well the celesta is going to come out. I would actually score this celesta an octave higher, right? Which is actually, it is already ottava, right? So this F sharp is actually going to sound two octaves higher if you hike it up an additional octave, right? And then you get the note, um, you get like the note above the piccolo note. All right. <clears throat> but yeah, and all of these other little touches, the glock and, and so on. Yeah, you get the, basically get the glock and spiel note. Um... Yeah, so nice, you know, nice delicate scoring, but just, yeah, just, I mean, just feel it's a little tortuous right in there with the, like, the trying to match the intonation of the high English horn player plus the oboe. I don't know if this is considered, you know, if this is intended to be one or two oboes, right? Because you didn't tell me, right? So you got to tell me. All right, and then once again, we've got, we go to, ba -da 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 -da. so one, one critique that I would have here is, just that like we've already had plenty of you know we've already had plenty of wind sound and it's good that you're matching it with the strings right but I would have the strings be louder than the clarinet right because right here you just have you, you know you've mezzo forte clarinet we've already heard clarinet starting off a phrase right but now here we've got same thing clarinet again right plus just a little bit of backing by the 
first violin. What if this were actually a blended sound where it was really a string sound that had thickening of the of the both clarinets or one clarinet? Okay. All right, and you know, once again, I'm going to keep mentioning this till I'm blue in the face. The melody note here is D sharp. Da 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 D sharp C sharp with the F sharp above as the uh, as the harmony note, right? So it kind of right right now we've got the score da 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 da, which sort of sets up a falling down of a fourth, which isn't in the original. Um, piano part so you know, watch out for you know watch out for the things like that okay and then we got this <clears throat> we've got this um nice texture going on in here like the the celesta is kind of going back and forth <clears throat> these are going to be kind of funky notes you know like when you play a bell when you play bell-like instruments on the very lower you know the tone bars or the keys or whatever they stop having this sort of ding sound and they kind of have a thunk, 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 thunk kind of a sound. So getting we're getting towards there. When we get below C or middle C, C sharp, so on, and getting lower, it has that kind of like, you know, you kind of hear almost a knocking sound um, of the, you can hear the hammers against the, against the face of the, the metal more than you actually hear the ting, right? So watch out about that with lower... And celesta, like the first octave of the celesta. Not so bad right in this area, but it's still not the greatest. Anyway, so that's going back and forth and keeping in mind that this is sounding an octave higher, right? So this is kind of going in octaves with the first violin or the second violin. Um, and then we've got, we're adding a bassoon and horns. So pianissimo, pianissimo crescendo to what, right? I mean, to like we got mezzo piano here in the trumpets. Maybe mark mezzo piano at the end, because like you never know what the players are gonna think where they need to go, right? It, like pianissimo, they might get the idea they're meant to go to match the mezzo forte of other instruments around them, but they'll probably be listening to the mezzo piano of the trumpets and thinking, oh, we need to go towards that, right? But you, as the orchestrator, could be taking the initiative to tell them where they're headed, right? Because it's not enough to say, oh yeah, well, we're going to end up mezzo forte over here. You don't want them to be mezzo forte here and then drown out the rest of the group, right? Okay. Okay, here I feel the strings are a little too soft, right? You've got your bump, 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 bump. I think that this this pad behind, you really have a lot of pads going on here. Maybe they're, you know, maybe the horns could be playing pads in here rather than the strings all the time. There, Maybe there's a way you could sort of transfer that around so you're not stuck in that same strategy anyway but let's talk about the strategy you did take so flute bump 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 bum you, you know and then you have the same thing dun 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 this isn't quite functional to the music but um right it just like it you know I, I see what you're trying to do here you're adding this you know you're kind of trying to put this in the context of the line that is coming up and it doesn't quite work because there, you know, you didn't write in the resolution. Dun, 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 right? There's like a little resolution built into it, and that wasn't stated, right? So that makes this feel unnatural the, with the way that the trombone rises, which is going to be a very prominent line. It's not doubled uh, necessarily by something that is going to smooth it out, right? If it was doubled by cellos, then it would be a smoother sound. But right here, you know, um, essentially, it's the... <clears throat> it's the bass clarinet that is doing the doubling and that is not necessarily a sound that is smooth right i mean it i mean it is lower down but like right around this area it's a little um you know kind of gets in the way and then you have way down here you've got the um contra bassoon so that it's not the strongest combination of of octaves here if you know what i'm saying um anyhow um, and then da 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 da. So we don't have any wind texture um, carrying the top line here, right? We have the clarinet um, mixing. Excuse me, I said that wrong. We don't have the string texture um, uh, dominating or you know sort of pushing its its more silky texture more. Um, it's kind of more orchestral texture right in this area, right? So we've got the we've got the horns kind of brightening what is up an octave from it, right? And that is, you know, you've got 
you've got um, higher bass clarinet, which is kind of fun. The rest of the clarinets, uh, and then strings and some trombone at the bottom. All right, so it's actually pretty spare. There, you could have added a little bit more in here, like maybe the English horn um, taking the octave below the this top line right here. Um, yeah, so so there there are just some missing voices here in this in this whole chordal framework. Um, so yeah, just you know. So when you throw in this this sort of uh, this little chirp or this sort of kind of whirring sound over the top, um, then uh, like we sort of kind of lose the sense of the of you know what does what is the melodic contour here really right? Especially since you're going up to a forte and coming back down again, whereas this is just mezzo forte right, and then diminuendo. So by the time by the time we're getting to the end here, really like people are just thinking about this upper line and they're not thinking about anything else. What if you didn't have the oboes doubling here? What if it was just flutes and you had the flutes playing flutter tonguing all the way through? Right? That would sound really really cool. That would you know that would have a kind of a more kind of whirring whizzing sound. Now, one thing that I really did like was the way that you kind of rescored this right in here with the horns coming in adding this new harmonic context here leading to like a real kind of Ravel ninth chord sort of feeling right here at the beginning of this um, you know bum 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 really feels like Ravel with the way you set things up here by the horns and that's that's really fun um, I hope that was intentional because it was a you know if so it was a really great way of doing that and and you know, we've got the celesta and like once again like you're getting into that really funky octave it's going to be almost inaudible against the violins the way that you've got this score this is you would have to have almost no winds in here you would have to have the uh violins scored like piano and then you would get a good blend here with this kind of line here in the in the celesta like if you really wanted this to be doubled well with the uh, strings, it would be better to use like a vibraphone, right? That would be, um, that would give you more projection and a and a better balanced kind of a sound here. But, but you know the way that it is right now, that you were just really not going to hear the celesta. And in fact, in the the mock up, it actually shows you that that you know it tells you um, that there is going to be that problem, and it's it's not just the mock up being bad. Okay. Now here, like these harp chords, they're really not going to last two bars, and they they almost sort of look like um, they almost look like like horn chords, really, to me, like a horn pad. And I'm just wondering if there would have been some other way of realizing these rather than just like you know just throwing them to the harp. Uh, but here, I would just like have these as um, as chords scored for just one bar and then don't worry about the second bar because it's really not going to last that long in the ear of the of the of the audience okay and then you know we've got some more of this back and forth stuff here which is really really fun it has a nice kind of chattering kind of bustling energy my only problem here is when you go to the slower tempo it just doesn't seem to add what it did before, right? So there's, there's, it's much slower, so you don't feel the bustle. And I kind of feel that it's a little, like, it's almost as if we're using this strategy for a little bit too long, right? It's kind of going on a little too, you know, like maybe there could have been some other way of, of supporting with motion rather than just back and forth chords. Okay, so, I mean, you did the idea really, really well. Oh look, you know, here's nicely art, you know, nicely articulated mezzo staccato, right? That's just how to do it, right? All right, so let's talk about the actual scoring of the passage. All right. Um, yeah, I, I almost feel as if like the melody could have been lower like you know maybe like if the winds you had cho chosen different winds like starting here on those pitches that you are and then then instead of jumping the octave here just leave it down there on that e 
using clarinets and oboe or whatever to climb up from there and then eventually adding flute when it gets higher rather than immediately jumping to like a higher place and and you know just really filling in the sound picture the way that it is cool bassoon scoring right in here and and it, along with the bass clarinet it's very nice um yeah i mean yeah just except for that celesta i don't really have a big problem with this i think it's it's you know pretty nicely done um all right now da 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 bum 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 yeah um and this has got some really good energy once again i you know i da 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 da, da, da. i think you should write this out as like if you really intend 16th notes here write out a single beat of 16th notes like you know, B, 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 like four Bs in a row as 16th notes, and then go to the abbreviation. Just so that it's really, really, really clear. I'm just getting nervous about the way people are scoring, um, you know, 16th note tremolo so much, especially in this challenge. It would, I just like, you know, the context, I'm just like kind of missing the context of whether or not they really mean a measured tremolo of 16th notes or just like real kind of unmeasured tremolo. Uh, just because of the because of the way that it's scored, it really feels more like a textural unmeasured tremolo the, with the way that a lot of this is, and and yet I'm seeing the just the two beams. So it you know count me confused. It just it's just not as clear. And then you know when you have like symbol rolls, right? So it, it's less obvious. All right, now here we have just have this kind of massive da 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 this kind of combination of of notes here. Here you're starting off on a G-sharp, fairly low. It's not going to be heard that well, but by the time you get to the D, we're getting some more energy in the flute timbre. So it's it's okay to start from a place where it's less heard if you are arcing upwards to something that is clearer. That's fine. Okay. Um, yeah, and, and this is really, you just have to understand this is really a massive, you know, flute plus oboe plus... Uh, clarinet we're not really sure if this is a two or you know what like how many players on a part whatever I got that wrong for a couple of bars but but you know but the most of these most of this score here is not telling me at all so not really sure how to proceed okay this is kind of cool here like adding voices with the um, with the trombone that's gonna come through really nice just be careful that it doesn't overwhelm the music probably we would be better to mark this entire thing down. I don't know what P mezzo piano means. What does what does P mezzo piano mean? Okay, better just to have piano, right? And or pianissimo crescendo to mezzo piano if you want this to balance. Otherwise, these trombones are just going to stick out like a sore thumb. They're just going to be really way too prominent in the texture. Okay? Uh, now here, if you're going to roll up to any any um, um, if you're going to roll up to any dynamic that is as loud as mezzo forte, and you're going to quickly want to diminish, rather than diminishing across two or three or four bars, then it's better just to stop to stop your roll right here and then just let it hang. Okay, because there, you, you're not going to be able to, like the there's nothing you're going to be able to do with your sticks to sort of bring down the energy. The symbol will be vibrating and it'll be resisting that. So it's better just to let it kind of let it go and just let it die off. All right, so just a just just an easier way for the player. Okay, so yeah, so balance this out, make this softer, and the rest of it I think will work just fine. Okay, and I think that. You could, you could have brought this down, like instead of just mezzo forte diminuendo, you could have gone mezzo forte diminuendo to piano in the second beat, right? And I think it's just way, way clearer because there are so many fermatas in here and you don't know what the conductor is going to be doing. The conductor might throw this hairpin away completely and just say, look, just scratch off, you know, everybody got out their pencils, scratch off the diminuendo hairpin and just give me piano in the second beat. Right, and I will just guide you through the rest of the end of the bar. It's probably that's probably what would happen, I would think. Um, so yeah, I've already talked about 
how this just sort of seems like it's getting to be too much, the back and forth strategy here. Okay, now this feels like maybe we're getting towards the, you know, I would say, oh, maybe, you know, were you running out of steam here or kind of not sure, but like then you did an entire, like you kept on going. I think you did the entire arrangement, which I really would have liked to look at if you were at a higher level of support. So think about that in the future, possibly. Um, but here we got the bum, 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 really the, you know, the flute, uh, you know, this is actually a pretty nice combination. Flute plus celeste is going to be at the same pitch as the flute, actually, because this is sounding an octave higher. But I'm really not so sure if the... I mean, this, I guess it could work in octaves with the celesta. Um, it's really kind of turning into more of a thing for harp and and so on. Yeah, but it's really kind of cool the way this all kind of climbs up there, the glockenspiel on top. Very, very glittery, very bright, right? We're of a bright garden. So, um, and you know, I like kind of some of the added pitches in here just to kind of um, kind of increase the frequency of the rhythm and then just like the little uh, the little passage at the end. This probably should cover, you know, more ground, right? You can do more pianistic like uh, uh, phrasing on harp because actually the harpists, you know, like knowing what the idea is, like what is the entire idea. And same thing is true for Celesta and Glockenspiel. Those are notes that have their own uh, kind of very gooey um, kind of sustain. So, you know, they don't, they're not really thinking about it in terms of breathing, right? But it's still just really lovely, um, that nice combination. I would say like here, you really want to highlight the, um, just this beautiful magical sound of the flute plus these um, like the harp and the and the bell-like instruments. So probably is better just to keep the uh, accompaniment really simple rather than distracting from that. And like you know, because the way that it's going back and forth is kind of saying, "Hey, pay attention to the accompaniment down here." Meanwhile, you're trying to make this really important point here. Um, you know, this sort of exploring this color of brightness so you know what if instead of all of this back and forth stuff you just have simply had some harmonics here right some some you know chord like in like uh, artificial harmonics um, that sort of supported what was going on above right, just a thought okay so thank you again Wocek um, just really great to look at your score to have you as part of this uh, as the a part of this orchestration challenge to um, to ha have you support on Patreon. And, um, you know, it, it would be really great to see what you thought of some of the other scores in this um, this dotted semi-brev uh, collection that I have just evaluated today. You know, I I put a lot into it. It was um, it was very very exciting to do, and I just had a huge amount of fun. And I'll probably have to give myself a day off to let my throat recuperate um, before I do another collection of scores. But I would really like to know what you thought. So if you can maybe on Patreon or maybe on YouTube, if you can add a few comments, um, you know, some constructive feedback for some of the other. Uh, participants at this level I think it would be just really great it would be great to see what you think you know supportive of course like not saying ah oh, just throw away everything between A and B it was horrible don't say things like that but you know but if you could just like maybe like in the same in the same vein as I am giving you feedback if you could give them feedback um, and you know and and I'm sure that they'll have some really interesting things in addition to what I had to say about your score so that would be really great and I I look forward to you entering this orchestration challenge again next year I have a couple of ideas of what I want to do I'm actually even considering approaching the estate of this one composer whose work you would think by now would be public domain but they lived to very old age okay more I will not say but um, but yeah but I would just like to um, you know I'd like to see your scores again and um, if you have anything that you need me to evaluate here and that this is true for everybody watching this on patreon you know, if you have something you want me to evaluate in my regular monthly score evaluations just let me know okay 
Okay, so thanks again. That is it for me for today. And this was just really an exciting ride just to see so many different uh, viewpoints and perspectives and ideas of how to make something sound great, you know? And I think that people mostly achieve that. And that's very, very uh, heartening for me to see from so many different orchestrators. So I will be back in a day or two, probably check out some website evaluations and, uh, and then I will start on the Brev evaluations pretty quickly. Thanks everyone. <laughs>